What I see uh, in the hospital in terms of harassment is bullying by powerful people who are running the hospital administration or running the employment workplace. And this bullying takes the form of sometimes it's passive aggressive behavior, not getting you a scalpel when you need a scalpel or not getting the, the medications or the supplies that are necessary, or not covering a shift, or not relieving you for lunch. There's all different kinds of ways to bully, and then there's physical things. Blocking somebody from passing through the hallway, slapping them on the backside, rubbing their shoulders in a way that's unwelcome, and sometimes it's just words. When I talk to people about what is harassment, what I see is, Harassment is a departure from how we treat each other as people. And you just start treating people like dirt and garbage that you don't regard. This entire proceeding is ended. With that gavel, Chairman Joseph Biden ended three of the most remarkable days in the history of the Congress. Senators investigating allegations of unwanted sexual advances by a Supreme Court nominee had waded out into uncharted and often seamy waters, hoping to arrive at the truth. But when the hearings ended at 2 o'clock this morning, 33 hours and 22 witnesses after they began, the Senate was right back where it started having to weigh his word against hers. Anita Hill, a University of Oklahoma law professor, worked for Clarence Thomas during the early 1980s at the Department of Education Welcome, and at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. She Professor appeared before the Senate Judiciary Committee to tell her story. His conversations were very vivid. He spoke about acts that he had seen in pornographic films, involving such matters as women having sex with animals and films showing group sex or rape scenes. He talked about pornographic materials depicting individuals with large penises or large breasts involved in various sex acts. On several occasions, Thomas told me graphically of his own sexual prowess. Because I was extremely uncomfortable talking about sex with him at all, and particularly in such a graphic way, I told him that I did not want to talk about these subjects. Judge Clarence Thomas had appeared to be within days of confirmation to the Supreme Court when the Anita Hill story broke. Now he was forced to return to the Judiciary Committee to defend himself, and did so with a blistering attack against Judge. his accuser his opponents, and against the committee itself. In the fall of 1991, a stunned and confused nation watched a law professor charge a Supreme Court nominee with blatant sexual harassment on primetime television. Stunned because never before had there been this kind of media attention to sexual harassment. Confused because the lines can seem unclear and sexual harassment is inextricably aligned to perception. Shortly thereafter, the nightly news and national magazines carried stories of widespread sexual harassment and discrimination in the military. Those events brought to light something that millions of Americans already knew. Sexual harassment and retaliation is a pervasive, destructive, social, legal, and ethical problem. And it is a problem which workers have not escaped. Sexual harassment, a form of sex discrimination and retaliation for reporting it, is one of the most persistent and destructive problems in the U.S. workplace. While potentially a problem for both sexes, the majority of sexual harassment is from men to women, and few working women have not experienced sexual harassment. Although sexual harassment is clearly illegal, it continues despite the high cost to the employee and the harassed individual. And despite the protections of the law, many who have been harassed do not bring complaints. Sex role stereotyping, distribution of power, and socialization are among the chief factors contributing to sexual harassment. Filing charges can be humiliating. Victims may feel their charges will be ignored or downplayed, or they may be accused of behavior that invited the offensive conduct. They may be ridiculed, face hostility or retaliation, poor work assignments, reduced hours, poor evaluations, or even the loss of a job. 
Still others don't know their rights, are confused about where the lines are drawn, or simply don't know what to do. The Insider Exclusive Investigative News Team discovered that physician assistants and nurses, mostly women, rarely reported incidents of sexual harassment or retaliation to their supervisors. The greater the nurses and medical staff's distress, the less likely she is to report an incident. Sexual harassment and retaliation against those who report it is extremely costly in terms of both human dignity and human resources. Fortunately, the laws to protect nurses and physician assistants from sexual harassment and retaliation are already on the books. Compliance, sound institutional policy, and nurses fully understanding their legal rights continue to be problems. What is clear is that sexual harassment and retaliation is against the law. Since 1964, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act has prohibited discrimination in employment conditions because of an individual's sex. In 1976, it was acknowledged that Title VII also prohibits sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination. Unlawful hostile environment harassment may occur even where there has been no tangible job detriment, but where sexually harassing conduct is so severe or pervasive that it alters an employee's working conditions. Nurses associations strive to eliminate sexual harassment for nurses in all work settings. First and foremost, they recommend that preventive measures be established. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in work harassment, Ani Shapourian's story. To examine how Lawrence Bohm, founder of the Bohm Law Group, successfully won a landmark $168 million verdict for his client, Ani Shapourian, against Catholic Healthcare West, doing business as Mercy General Hospital in Sacramento, California. The jury unanimously decided Ani was subject to a hostile work environment, retaliation for protected workplace complaints, defamation, and intentional interference with economic advantage. The court awarded this staggering payout to her after co-workers allegedly repeatedly slapped her behind and pulled her into their laps. Ani had filed approximately 18 complaints with Mercy General Hospital in Sacramento, California, but the hospital failed to investigate the reports and even denied receiving the complaints. And as a result of reporting the hospital's dirty laundry, the hospital harassed her and subjected her to unwarranted accusations and discipline, and eventually terminated her. A federal court jury found the hospital and its owner, Catholic Healthcare West, liable for $125 million in punitive damages. They also added $42.7 million in compensation for lost wages and mental anguish suffered by Ani. Ani speculated that hospital administrators put up with misbehavior in the cardiac unit and tolerated the surgeon's outsized egos because cardiac surgery tends to bring in the most money for any hospital facility. Lawrence Bohm has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Sacramento, in California, and across the United States. His goal is not only to get justice for his clients, but to make sure that everyone is treated with equal respect and dignity as guaranteed under the Constitution of the United States. He has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. His amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Sacramento, California. It is my great pleasure to introduce Lawrence Bohm to the show. Welcome to the show, Lawrence. Thank you. It's my joy to be here. Tell our audience a little bit about your firm, what type of law you practice, and I understand even though we're in Sacramento, we have a lot of offices around the state. Um, well, my firm uh, focuses on representing all of California 
Uh, right now, our two physical offices are Los Angeles and Sacramento. We have next year, uh, we'll be opening an office in San Diego, and we have plans also for Fresno as well as Redding to make sure that we can protect people uh, in every corner of the state. Today we're here because you got a tremendous verdict, 160, I think it was $168 million for your client. Plus or minus. Yeah, Ani Shapourian. Yes. Um, tell our audience who Ani is and why this whole case came about to begin with. Ani Chaporian is a strong, brilliant, um, ethical woman, a physician's assistant with a medical master's of science degree from the very prestigious Yale University uh, Medical School program. She had worked in heart surgery centers in Southern California. As a physician's assistant. Correct? As a physician's surgical assistant. Mm -hmm. The correct title is physician's assistant, but she specifically was helping surgeons with heart surgery. And that means harvesting the veins in your arms or legs and of course holding the heart for the surgeon during the procedure so that he can sew those uh, veins or arteries to the heart to do what they call a bypass surgery. Uh, and of course the aftercare uh, following the surgery and the pre-surgery workup. Um, it's, a, it's a hard life being a surgeon or a surgeon's assistant. Now, in this particular case, she was working at Mercy General Hospital right here in Sacramento. Yeah, right? she was working in what is largely considered the crown jewel of the uh, now known as Dignity Health Health System. Back then it was known as Catholic Healthcare West. Uh, I believe at that time it was the fifth largest healthcare hospital system in the country. Yeah. And I say it's the crown jewel because the Sacramento Mercy General Hospital location was the highest volume heart surgery center, meaning the most patients, the most procedures for this fifth largest healthcare chain. All of that work was happening in Sacramento. In yeah. fact, people would be flown in from around. So here you have a physician assistant who works, helps surgeons. She's dedicated her life basically to working in this very sensitive and very complicated and complex surgeries. And what goes wrong? What goes wrong is an environment of bullying and harassment and petty egos and ego struggles between primarily one surgeon who was very mean and rude, shouting and screaming, calling patients train wrecks, uh, making staff who he didn't like stand around aimlessly while major surgery is going on and these people could be helping the patient. He would berate them, have them stand in the corner. Poor Ms. Chaporian made to wear surgical loops on her head uh, that she didn't actually need, told to stand in the corner while her help could have been utilized for the patient. Told her to stand in the corner? Just stand like away. A, like a school person. Yes, just stand there. Just stand As there. As punishment or something, well, to the punish, humiliate her. The punishment gets way worse, because yeah. nothing punishes a caring healthcare professional yeah. like punishing the patient. Right. It's like slapping somebody's child to make the, pa the parent angrier. So one of the things that would happen is Ms. Chaporian one of her jobs was to pull up on the thoracic cavity so that they could get access to the heart. And on one occasion, the surgeon kept telling her to pull harder. Again, this is passive aggressive behavior. This is, I'm gonna make you do something even though I know you don't need to do it. Mm -hmm. So he keeps telling her to pull harder, claiming he can't see until unfortunately the patient's rib broke. Mm. And when the, when the rib broke, Another nurse actually reported this event. That one wasn't even directly reported initially by Ms. Chaporian. Mm -hmm. Ms. Chaporian, who's known for making over 18 complaints, and 18 of her complaints were in writing, but there were numerous daily complaints about the horrible way that the patients were being treated, the horrible way that the staff was being treated, and she wasn't the only one complaining. Yeah. We found out two years before this event that a nurse had been complaining that the same surgeon who was angry at her for being a woman or being 
taller and big bone just didn't seem to like her yeah. and his way of getting at her was to hide a sponge behind the heart. Now eventually she was terminated, correct? She was horribly fired. She was yeah. escorted off the property by a big burly security guard. She went to work for another employer. Wasn't easy. Yeah. She did not even think about filing a lawsuit at this time, even though she had definitely been wronged. What brought about the lawsuit? Well, when she, when she got her next job working yeah. for a large radiology group helping with um, gynecological surgeries, totally different kind of surgery, but she still found some love in her work, especially working with women, helping them with their issues. What happened was she needed to receive something called privileging. Privileging is when a hospital gets an application from a healthcare worker that says, please let me do procedures in your hospital. In this case, the radiology company was asking one of these Mercy General Hospital related hospitals to allow her in to do surgery. When they went through that process, not only did they deny her her privileges, which was the first time in the history of the hospital that they denied privileges to a physician's assistant, but what they said was, because you kept notes and records of what was happening to the patients at Mercy General Hospital, we also find that you violated patients' privacy, which was her way of protecting yeah. these patients sure. now became a theme of this is a, from their perspective, and this is why the defamation verdict was so big, almost yeah. I think it's $22 million yeah. just on the way they, they hurt her reputation. Mm -hmm. um, but they cast her as a person who is stealing your patient information and, and violating your privacy and isn't good to work with. And they blocked her from getting that job. Yeah. And since that time, she's virtually unhirable unless it's a hospital that actually cares right. about patient safety more than they care about hiding their, their reputation behind you know, false ads. Yeah, now the trial lasted what, five weeks? Um, no, the trial was very fast. This right. was a two-week trial. Two-week trial. The, the jury was out three days? Appro approximately. They go out twice, once yeah. for the regular damages and once for the yeah. punitive. They came back with some record verdict. What was your uh, first impression when you heard that the verdict was $168 million? Well, I think first uh, my client started crying, then I started crying, <laughs> then I think I saw some members of the jury start to cry. Yeah. Were you shocked at the size of the verdict? I was shocked at the jury's ability to appreciate what we were telling them. Yeah. I actually, before we got that verdict, some people said I was maybe tempting fate, but I sent an email around to a lot of the trial lawyers in town and I invited them to come and see what was likely to be a historic case. <laughs> And so I knew I was chasing yeah. history, and I yeah. told the jury one of the most important... You could see important, it on their faces when you were talking to them. You could see it, and, yeah. and, and the message was clear. This is a case about our hospitals. And I told them, I said, listen, what we have to do here with this verdict is it's not enough that people in California hear about this verdict. Look around, folks. We're in federal court. This is a national case. People are going to be reading about this in hospitals in Guam. Mm -hmm. We need to get this right, and we need to, to send a message that tells not just this hospitals, but all hospitals, that you need to treat your patients and your employees with the respect that a noble profession like healthcare work deserves. I mean, I'm the son of a doctor and a nurse. That's the thing that always surprises people, considering how much time I spend suing hospitals. Yeah. But these doctors and these nurses, these are part of our people our community mm -hmm. and if we don't stand up for them uh, we're doomed as a society there is a national audience watching the show right now so there are other people like Ani who are in similar situations that are being sexually harassed patient safety isn't being uh, followed what do you have to say to them what should they do first these people need to live up to their ethical and moral obligations to speak out. Also remember, there's safety in numbers. You know, it's hard to get rid of one employee standing by 
you know, by themselves when they're making protected complaints, it's even harder to get rid of two or three or four who are all corroborating that this conduct is happening. Don't leave your coworker out to dry. Be brave and trust the jury system. It will work for you if your case is true. But at the same rate, don't be so petty. Develop some thick skin. Don't call my office because they changed from Doritos to Fritos in the uh, lounge and you're mad about it because nobody cares about that. Mm -hmm. What we care about is safety. We care about people. And so the other sage advice is put it in writing. And when you deliver that writing, make sure you know who you delivered it to, what you delivered, and why you were delivering it. And, and make a some, copy of it. Make a copy of it yeah. and put some notes on it about yeah. this is what I was doing here. This is who I gave it to. Yeah. I mean, Ms. Chaporian uh, was their worst enemy because she's so smart and so detail-oriented and, in fact, made a lot of really useful contributions to the department. The problem for them was she was a terrific historian. She took notes about everything that happened in a little journal, so much so one of the things that was on the way to her being fired, they wanted her to give them her journal. And she realized, if I give them this journal, I'm never getting it back. In fact, many of those 18 complaints submitted on their system, they couldn't find. They claimed they never received them. Right. Clearly, the jury didn't believe it, especially the one that stamped, yeah. received human yeah. resources. Wow, you did a tremendous job, and I'm glad you could share the inside look into this case. Thank you very much for being on our program. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.